welcome to the Bath Studio School's EU referendum broadcast in partnership with Summer Valley FM. The time has just hit 10 a.m. My name is Ewan Barnett. I will be with you for the next hour. Today, we will be talking with experts from across the region to give us an insight into the Leave and Stay campaigns. In today's debate, there's a chance for you to get involved by tweeting us using the hashtag BathEUREF, and Zoe will be standing by in our social media hub to get your questions answered. Zoe, what's the feeling on our social media channels so far? Buzzing. A lot of people are tweeting in about whether to leave or stay. We have one tweet here from Brian Kieran, for our, who lives in Nottingham, in the UK. He says, group of 16-year-olds discussing EU ref. One just observed the decision will affect them more than many voters. We should be mindful of this. OK, thank you, Zoe. That's a very interesting tweet there. Um, now, first, uh, we have two candidates with us today. We have Tim, Tim Newark and Sir Philip Lowe. Um, and they will both be giving, they'll have a two set, they'll have a two minute pitch um, on why you should vote, what you vote tomorrow. Um, so Tim, uh, could you please pitch to the public about why they should vote? I think it's a wonderful thing to be a part of a free and sovereign country and I don't know why you would not want to vote for that. Uh, lots, of, lots of people live in very repressive parts of the world where they don't have these chances. We have that vote to regain that sovereignty and to carry on our proud tradition of freedom. So I think it's, it's, it's a wonderful and serious choice to make. Um, there's been a lot of talk about um, how if we leave it'll be doom and gloom for uh, business. Uh, we're the fifth largest economy in the world. We aren't like Norway, which is the 28th largest, or um, Switzerland being compared with them, which is the 19th. We're the fifth largest economy in the world, so we can easily make trade deals, and it'll be a wonderful opportunity to trade with the rest of the world on our terms, and I think we will prosper and do fabulously well. After all, we've done it for 250 years. Uh, I'm sure we can carry on doing that. Um, then, of course, there is a problem about, or the, or the discussion, the debate about migration, and a lot of people feel let down. I mean, don't forget, all these experts said that in 2004, only 13,000 migrants would come from Eastern um, Europe. I mean, there's been hundreds of thousands since then. They got that wrong. And I think also David Cameron said, uh, I want to get um, these migration figures down to tens of thousands. And he's failed on that. And I think a lot of people feel let down. And I think those voters will now have a chance to express their feelings. They don't trust the politicians anymore. So I think this is a wonderful um, opportunity to, to return power to people, really. They can actually have a view on their future and shape it for their um, families. So I, th I think Brexit is, is a wonderful opportunity to have. I think it's great that it's, uh, it's been given to the British people. And let's hope uh, they embrace freedom and independence and want to prosper with the rest of the world. Okay, thank you, Tim. Um, next up, we have Sir Philip Lowe, who was a member of the EU Commission. Um, Ms. Sir uh, Lowe, you may begin. Well, good morning, everyone. And um, I think, uh, as Tim has said, this is a wonderful opportunity for dem democracy to speak. Um, the issue is whether we can defend UK interests better in Europe, in the EU, or outside. Now, since we joined the EU, uh, Britain has fought for various things which it regarded as important. A single market, a frontier free market, a level playing field for trade and investment. It fought for enlargement. Mrs. Thatcher made a speech in 1988 calling for Europe to cover all the countries of Europe together. And that's been done. And we are close allies of those countries. And we benefit from the fact that now, in Europe, we have not people wanting to have a super state, but the vast majority of the European Union's member states are like the UK. They are sovereign, independent countries who want to do things together in certain areas. Now, it is whenever we face problems inside the EU or outside, uh, you've got to ask the question, uh, is it better to work inside or outside to solve those problems. And um, the idea of being free and taking back control sounds very attractive. But when you actually scrape back 
the detail of that, uh, you, you realize that it doesn't correspond with reality. We're living in a globalized world with globalized trade, global corporations, common problems which no country can solve on their own, uh, climate change, um, even managing the internet, and also the problems which are face we're facing today on migration. Okay, thank you. And, thank and you. we need to find answers for those problems. I think the best way to do it is overwhelmingly to stay in and work with our nearest okay. neighbours first. Okay, thank you. Um, so at the Bath Studio School, we have done a poll on what young people may be thinking. So people, are, people in our in our school have actually voted. Almost 100% of people have voted leave. Um, what do you both think of these results that our school has voted? Fabulous, I'd say. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I, th I think it's great. I think young people uh, can see the importance of this. I mean, it really is. It's, 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 it's not about the detail. It's about the big picture, I think, actually. And I think people, young people grasp that. And this really will determine the uh, character of this country for years to come. And also, I think the um, Leave uh, campaign has been very optimistic and very bold and saying that we've uh, been a very successful trading, com uh, trading country. Let's do that once again. And we've got great talent here huge talent and I think let's uh, trade with the rest of the world and embrace the rest of the rest of the world okay um, we're in the European Union we're the most, one of the most successful countries in the European Union uh, despite all the problems which uh, Tim and others have referred to and I think uh, before you decide if you can decide to vote for leave think about how much of the baby you're throwing out with the bathwater why isn't it possible to solve the problems which exist with the people around us in a way which in any case we'll have to do if you have to go to the UN or to the WTO to solve a problem if you've already got the European Union you've persuaded the European Union to work with you to get a result it's almost certain that you're going to get it because the EU is a strong force when it's in the international negotiations um, so um do you think the Prime Minister's job is safe no matter what the outcome of tomorrow's referendum? Uh, I think he's toast, really. I think he's toast on two fronts, really. First, he, if obviously he um, loses, I mean, he's going to be out. Because how can you trust someone like that to negotiate Brexit, really? I mean, he's let, he tried to um, strike a deal beforehand and got a very poor deal. So, I think so do you think his negotiation in the EU I, is I think poor? his negotiating skills are appalling, but I mean that's probably a reflection of how the European Union views uh, Britain, really. Um, and then secondly, if he does win, um, I think he, he's, he's, he's led such a negative campaign that I think a lot of um, conservatives found absolutely shocking, really. I mean, we're expecting a debate, yeah. but it's been pretty um, low stuff. And so I think on that front, he's, he's lost respect, I think. Okay. Lost respect. Um, what, what do you think? Well, first of all, this is, a f this is the, the initial debate, the first debate we've had in the UK about anything European. Because before then, both parties, for internal reasons, never wanted a debate. When I was head of office for, for two British commissioners, we were under instructions from both parties never to say anything about Europe in the UK. So it's quite the, resu the, result, the result is that the facts don't dis get discussed, the policy options don't dis get discussed. And I think that if you have a government which has actually, governments which have successfully negotiated a rebate on the budget, have successfully negotiated change in the CAP, have successfully negotiated enlargement and single market, that they, they were getting somewhere. But in the last 10 years, the UK has concentrated simply on standing back from what's going on instead of arguing for what it can get out of Europe. And we're not in Schengen, we're not in the Euro. A lot of people I talk to all over the United Kingdom think we're in the Eurozone and we're paying for the other countries uh, to be bailed out. It's not true. This is a, a lie, a big, big lie. <laughs> and we've got to make sure that the facts are on the table. Now, as far as the right Prime Minister is concerned, um, he, he decided for domestic reasons to have a negotiation over six to nine months, and he achieved some results. So but some of the problems take longer than that to resolve, and that should be realistic. And so his position is, of course, difficult. 
Tim, have you got anything to counteract the argument there? Uh, yeah, I, I just think um, it, it's... it's. I mean, if we've not got a good deal now, we're sure as hell aren't going to get it if we vote to stay in. So I you mean, think if we stay in, nothing's going uh, to change? Absolutely. And I think he's very strange. You've got a lot of Labour MPs coming back chastened from talking to their voters and feeling how strongly they feel for Brexit. And they say, well, maybe we should do something about migration. It, it's too late. I mean, they had a chance. The Tony Blair government uh, messed that up if I just opened the doors. And then um, David Cameron's not done any better. I mean, again, politicians promise these things because voters are concerned about them. But do they do anything about it? No, they don't. That's why we're at this point. And that's why this referendum is so special, because it's an opportunity to really kind of say, you're not telling us the truth, you're not taking care of us. But could you say the Brexit campaign has told us lies in the fact that the 350 million that was apparently we pay every week, that got diluted down to 110 million. Mm. So, could, so could people say, well, if, if Europe's lying to us, but how isn't, shouldn't the Brexit campaign being honest to us? Uh, I, over -exaggerating I, I, would, I would agree with you. I mean, I mean, Brexit doesn't need to lie. I mean, I don't know why. I mean, I think that, that's the gross figure, and then, of course, that does include the rebate and does include the kind of money that we, we get paid back, which is our cash, but we get mm -hmm. paid back. And it's actually something more like 288 million a week, so it, it's not kind of... Huge, that, that's that's huge. still a lot of money. Yeah, well, it is, absolutely. That's the point. So I think, again, particularly in that debate last night when uh, they were saying, lie, lie, I mean, not lie. I mean, again, all this, 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 this fabrication of doom and gloom, I mean, that's just made-up stuff. I mean, that's just speculation. So I think both sides have been pretty poor about that. I don't think you need to lie. I mean, the facts are as they are. Okay. Um, so, like, how do you think a Brexit will... Um, have an impact on education so that could be a uh, university level right the way down to nursery level do you think it will impact on education but just before that i mean let's get the the figures into perspective in terms of total government expenditure we're talking about one percent yeah. of uk expenditure not a massive amount of money uh, and by the way all the things which might be spent if we gave up spending that money in europe um, There'll be a lot of competition for that. And one of the things we've got to do is to recreate the administration in the UK to deal with the things which previously we had dealt in Brussels. So yeah. we'll see about that. Now, as far as education is concerned, it is primary uh, a responsibility of national governments and regional, in, for example, in Germany, of, of regional governments. Um, I can only think, just think of one word which might ha have an echo here in this school and in the university. It's Erasmus. Now, Erasmus was uh, invented by an official, a British official of the European Commission and put forward in, Br in, in Brussels. Things don't get decided by the Commission. They get decided by the ministers from the member states. That They approved Erasmus as a scheme for exchange of experience, and that required a lot of juggling about with the curricula in each of the universities, it's called the Bologna Agreements on, on, on uh, facilitating exchanges and research uh, efforts uh, between students. And I think that's something which is under, uh, under a question mark until such time as we renegotiate everything. Now, I'm not a doom and gloom person. I've been working in the European Union in areas where we've achieved positive results for everyone, but um, it will take a bit of time do you we come out to it, negotiate that again? Because um, I know people who are going to university and they're studying degrees that involve you to go to a European country mm -hmm. um, for work placements, such as. If we leave, would that be a threat? Would no, education, no. work experience be <laughs> I a threat? Mean, I mean, why would that be a threat? I mean, we work with over 100 international organisations now. We'll carry on doing that. I mean, that's what Britain does. But will, will it cost and, more? And uh, it, 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 it won't necessarily cost more. It could cost less. I mean, it depends on the negotiation of that. But, I mean, there's self-interest to keep these um, student exchanges going on, the whole wonderful um, European education. Why would that be at risk? You can just negotiate that as a separate thing. What I don't get is why you have to sh give away your sovereignty to be part of this trading block. Other countries don't. 
So I think if we get our sovereignty back, we can make all these deals, have all these student exchanges and things. I mean, why would we not? I mean, why would you not carry on with these things? I mean, CERN, as a scientific institution, very important to research now. We were founding members of that way before the European Union. We're key members of that. We would carry on doing that. So Brexit doesn't mean an end to any of those could things. Could I ask your opinion on um, how uh, the Treasury has said stuff like the, the, U the UK would go into recession? So I've heard apparently there would be a recession if the UK left the European Union. Well, I think you can make up all kinds of figures, can't you? I mean, it, it, I mean the Treasury does what the government want, wants it to do. I mean, it's paid for, well, it's actually paid for us, actually, but it's working on behalf of the government. And so they, they will come up with any scenario that suits the outcome that David Cameron wants. So I think it, it's kind of nonsense, and it's nonsense. They're predicting things in 2030. Do you, do you believe they're come predicting things? I'm just as sceptical as Tim is about long-term forecasts on mm. either side. Uh, what's clear is, and I think it's re recognized by both sides too, that if there was a Brexit, there will be a period of uncertainty. And business doesn't, and finance markets don't like uncertainty, and that could cause some, some disruption. Now, we're a big country. Uh, we've got some negotiating power. By the way, sovereignty is always negotiated away in a negotiation. Mm, yeah. You, 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 don't, you don't have it 100%. You, you deliver it, you, you, you look at the results of the negotiation and you get, the, get what you, you asked for or you get, get what you're, you're given if the other side is, is uh, more yes. powerful. And as far as student uh, grants, uh, student grants uh, and, and uh, permissions are concerned, obviously there are going to be questions of visa, visas. I was at the Eurostar um, queue um, about a year ago, and there was a, a gentleman behind me with his wife coming back from their holidays, and there was the EU queue and the non-EU queue. Mm -hmm. There was no one in the EU queue. There was a queue of people waiting for their passports to be stamped on the other side because they got need visas. He said, oh, I'm not going into the EU queue. I don't like the EU. One of the big benefits of the EU <laughs> has been visa-free visa um, residents, particularly for students. Okay. And, um, Zoe. Oh, oh Zoe's not quite at the moment. For me, you <laughs> um, so how could a Brexit um, impact the t uh, 27 state, the remaining states of the EU? Yes. Oh, you betcha. Yeah, I think there was a... Um, uh, there's, there's been an opinion poll in Sweden saying what their Eurosceptic feeling is, and it was 38 wanting out of Europe and they say but if Britain leaves what 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 would your feeling be and it went out to 58 so I think we will have enormous and a very positive impact on the rest of Europe and there will be referendums right across uh, France is pretty keen to get out amazingly one of the architects of it but the general popular voices for getting out okay. so it will be an earthquake Okay, um, what do you think? Well, that seems, sounds like a positive earthquake if I've heard Tim <laughs> right he's talking about we're full of optimism um, we're for a, you know, a bright new future. Oh, yes. I'm telling you that you can have that future without throwing away all the advantages you've got now. So you think we should properly, value the EU more? properly negotiating in Europe, which we haven't been doing for the last 10 years. So you believe we should be properly um, immerse ourselves in the EU and be thankful of it? Be Not more thankful, but you, I mean, I've, I've been working for the EU, for the Commission, but every government fights for what it can obtain in terms of results in the European Union. We fought as the UK for a single frontier free market. We got it. We fought against the other countries for enlargement and we got it. So what is preventing us going forward, taking the leadership on issues, for example, like immigration, which can't be solved simply by uh, closing the borders. You've got to think about the whole chain of Legal immigration, illegal immigration, asylum seekers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You've got to have an integrated policy. And if, and if you are an island like we are, just off the European so, coast. So, do you think? Do you think the whole um, the system of the UK and the European Union? Do you think everything could go into chaos if we leave? No. <laughs> well, then, listen. You, you, um, the UK is the fifth largest economy, but on the other side of the Europe of, of, of the Channel, there's some other quite sophisticated countries and they will be looking after their interests too. It is true as Tim says that the 
the, a vote to, uh, of Brexit in, in, in the UK <coughs> will have a destabilizing effect on okay. politics across Europe because of the influence of uh, not just disappointed voters, but people who are, have much more extreme views about, um, uh, for example, foreigners. Okay. Um, Zoe, could you please talk us through what people on social media are saying at the moment? We actually have a couple of questions here for our two guests. One is from Bailey Music, hashtag with Bath at the EU ref. Why has there been such a massive transfer of wealth to the rich under the EU? I think the EU represents the interests of the big companies who can, play, who can pay lobbyists to argue their cases. So I think, yes, the rich are getting richer. I think um, the migrant policy is definitely making the poor poorer. The Bank of England said that um, uh, working class uh, incomes have been depressed by at least 10%. So I think continued membership of the European Union will see the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer, definitely. I, I mean, I disagree totally. The European Union is not at the origin of the increased inequality inside the UK or anywhere else. We are dealing with issues about globalization here, where multinational corporations, not rich people, but multinational corporations employing a lot of people in the, U in the UK and elsewhere, um, certainly, uh, their interests are well represented in, in, the, in, in, uh, in Brussels and elsewhere. But uh, there's um, uh, a real problem for all European member states that they have let this inequality grow. And look at the people who are actually arguing for uh, Brexit uh, beyond the honest, disappointed person. <laughs> it is people who want more freedom Okay, um, for, last question, for capitalism and then we'll open work. up our question. So I'll have one more question, and then we'll open up um, to the floor. Um, so, do you, so my immigration has been, at, I think, at the centre point of the whole debate. Um, do you think migration can be controlled in the two scenarios that we have open to the public tomorrow? Yeah, yeah I, th I think so. But I mean, let's just look at. I uh, mean, mean, Sir Philip was saying that the European Union is, is good at dealing with these things. I think it's very bad at dealing with these things. I mean, when we had this migrant crisis um, earlier in the year, the response of the European—it was not response of the European Union. It was response of Angela Merkel. One state. I mean, she let the cat out of the bag that the Germans are in charge of this whole thing. And she said, yes, we'll have hundreds of thousands of migrants in, and every other country will have to take these people. And then she went to Brussels, and Brussels backed her up and said, yes, um, Hungary must take these people, Austria must take these people. And those countries had to turn around and say, no, thank you. We don't want that. And so okay. I think they've, and it's been very destabilizing. You've seen the, the actual rise of the far right particularly Austria, nearly voted in a far-right politician there because of this destabilizing and how the European Union has badly handled it. Okay. Well, I think a lot of people ask me, well, who are those people in Brussels uh, who are the European Union and why they are managing it so badly? Well, I've got news for you. The people who are taking those decisions are the national governments of the European Union. There is no, so far, no integrated immigration policy in the European Union at the European Union level because the ministers themselves have decided they don't want them. Now, why is that? Because half the people in Europe at, at a senior level think that immigration has been good for their economy, including in Germany. And there are plenty of people in, in the UK who also see, for example, in the city and elsewhere, hundreds and thousands of well-qualified people who've come in from outside the European Union and are, are contributing. There's the other side, okay. which we agree. Um, there is a question of control to ensure that it, there's no pressure on social services and no pressure on jobs. But in my view, that can only be solved by putting Mrs. Merkel, Mr. Cameron, and others together and, and making them answerable to parliaments about what should be done. OK, um, so now we're going to go to our studio audience who are ready to go with questions. Um, so could you put up your hand if you have a question? Um, so, first question, please. Does being in the EU make it easier for tariffs to come to the UK? So, to lower tariffs? Yeah, like tariffs. Yeah, yeah, sure. 
Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's the whole point, whole point of it. I mean, that was, that was a good thing. That's what we joined up in 1973 to remove all these tariffs and to trade. But then it turned in 1992 into a super national project, a United States of Europe, which I think is what we're talking about now. But certainly tariff-free trading is good. And I think since we are the fifth largest economy in the world, we'll probably establish a tariff-free or very low tariff-free deal following Brexit. So no big deal, really. I, I just like to say that you know, the reasons why trade becomes easier is lower tariffs and regulation which creates a level playing field across the two areas you're dealing with, whether it's a partner who is a bilateral partner or whether it's within the EU. And that's something which the EU has been able to, to facilitate and will go on facilitating. Um, if, if we go for a, a Brexit solution, you've got to deal with those problems also. Um, it will take longer. Uh, Boris Johnson said last night that he could negotiate a trade agreement within two years rather than seven years for the European Union. I'm afraid this is naive. The fact is that if you accept the conditions which your partner uh, imposes from the beginning of the negotiation, of course it, it, takes six, it could take six weeks then. Hmm. If you want to negotiate your own interests, you, you as, we, as, as, happens, as has happened both for the UK and the EU, you, you continue to negotiate hard to get the best deal. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have our next question now. Do you believe the government were being biased in the leaflets sent out urging people to vote? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the government's played um, hardball with this. They have come up with their own uh, fabricated views of what would um, happen. So, yeah, they've, 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 they've completely skewed it. But that's fair enough. I mean, they're on the stay side. But I think why there's a bit of anger and resentment among Brexit is that uh, they're, they're being paid for by the taxpayer. All these leaflets, all of the Treasury reports, it's all taxpayer funded. It seems a little unfair, really. And Brexit has done quite well on getting its message over without all the machinery of government. But, uh, yeah, it, it's, but still, it's a tough fight and bring it on, basically, I say. Well, that, I mean, it's, it was a decision of the UK government. They must have known that they were doing it at the time. Just like to say one thing, for the last 20 years, we've had five major newspapers uh, on a permanent campaign against the EU, not giving the facts, not discussing the issues. And we started this campaign already with communication to the public, which was very, very biased. So I thought, when I saw the government uh, book uh, uh, leaflet, OK, but it's a drop in the ocean compared with the effect, the impact, which the campaign of, of all those newspapers has had for many, many years. If you don't talk to the electorate about the issues you're facing in a, a negotiation or in the EU, you create a vacuum, and that vacuum is filled by ignorance. OK, um, to our next question, please. The EU interferes with the defence procurement and wants to set up its own army. How would that protect us? Yeah, I think the European Union has a dreadful um, history of um, dealing with international policies. Uh, in the Balkans, it was hopeless. I mean, that was something it was supposed to sort out on its own back door. NATO had to step in there. With the Ukraine, it actually um, provoked that crisis with Russia, and then it scuttled away, and it's been left up to NATO to have frequent exercises out there to make the Russians think twice about that. And the idea that you're going to have a European army now duplicating NATO seems balmy. It's a waste of money. And again, it's, 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 it's just... Uh, I wouldn't trust these people to run anything, and particularly not an army as important as that. Um, OK, to our next question, please. Uh, uh, do I get oh, a... Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, I'm not sure that who the, these people are. Um, there are people in Europe who want a European army. But the UK is always, and other countries, are totally opposed to it and have always blocked it. We've also always made sure that the NATO, the identity of NATO, is clearly uh, distinguished from anything the EU does. And NATO's role in Balkans is inevitable because there is no military role for the EU in there. What you forget is that after the war was over and after the Berlin Wall fell, the European Union has spent so much effort on moving Eastern European countries and Balkan countries into the market-based 
rule of law system which we've got in Europe. That's an achievement which no one talks about. Uh, it's as if somehow uh, this happens automatically once the shooting stopped, and this is not true. Okay, thank you. Um, to our next question, please. What slogan would you write on your campaign battle bus? I'm sorry, I missed that. Could you just repeat? Uh, what slogan would you write on if you had a campaign battle bus? What slogan would you write on it? Oh, freedom and sovereignty. Let's get it back. <laughs> um, what would you write? Sounds You're like safer, stronger, and better off inside the European Union. Okay, um, thank you. Um, to our next question, please. Would leaving the EU diminish Britain's influence on the world stage? Not in the slightest. I, th I think that's an absurd thing to say that. I, I think it would actually have more impact because we'd be able to do what we say we're going to do without having to talk to other people about it. And again, we're the fifth largest economy in the world. Let's just think about that. It's only China, the United States, Japan, Germany above. I mean, we are a top, still a top trading nation. And with all the power, we have enormous military presence and diplomatic presence around the world. Um, we're top players, so I don't know why that wouldn't carry on at all. The idea would be little kind of England is nonsense. We'll be actually Great Britain embracing the rest of the world. You know, we've got, we're members of the Commonwealth. We're a member of NATO, and by the way, Turkey is in NATO, <laughs> just, just to remind everyone about the criticisms of Turkey. Um, we're, we're a close ally of the, of the United States. And now we want to come out of the European Union to have more influence on what's going on. This is not right. This is crazy. We have a huge role, a leadership role, which we could play in Europe alongside uh, what is done outside with other partners. And by the way, all five of the Australia, Canada, all these prime ministers all say, stay in, in our interests and in yours. OK, thank you. Um, so I think to our uh, final question now. Um, what do you think the impact on young people leaving the EU will be? I think it will be a great unleashing of optimism and we'll be looking outward at the rest of the world. Um, practically, I mean, if that's what you're concerned about, I don't think there will be much of an impact. You'll still be able to study and visit Europe and uh, enjoy Europe. I mean, I'm a huge fan of you. I love you. I'm just not a fan of the European Union. And I think that's, that's the point, really. And I think um, you'll, you'll have a wonderful opt because you'll be part for free. You can vote, and your vote will matter, because you can vote those politicians out. At the moment, there's a lot of people who you can't vote out who are running your lives. Um, OK, thank you. So I'm going to ask... Well, well just say, who are the people who you can't vote out of office? Commissioners. Wait a minute. Commissioners? Bureaucrats. Are they un oh, wait a minute. <laughs> We're all bureaucrats at Whitehall or elsewhere. We're, we're, we're unelected, paid officials who work for politicians. But the commissioners in Brussels are not unelected, if you think about it. Every British commission, every commissioner in the European Union is nominated by the ruling party in the, in, of, the, of the country, of, of the mem each member state. And if you think Jonathan Hill is, is an unelected technocrat, it'll take 30 seconds to get a vote in the... In the, in, the, in the House of Commons in order to prove that he is elected. So that's a, a nonsense. We're not getting rid of anyone. Last time the Commission was criticised by the Parliament for not managing some of its aid programmes proper, properly, it was sacked. I was there at the time um, in a, as, a, as an official somewhere in the services. They sacked the Commission and a number of the Commissioners could not come back the ones who had been responsible for the areas before. The Parliament has the power to sack the Commission and did it in 1999. People seem to forget that. Now, can we sack our Prime Ministers and our Ministers who actually take the decisions in Brussels? Well, uh, isn't that a, a serious national concern? Personally, I think that it would have been much better uh, for the European Parliament to stick with a dual mandate with national parliamentarians sitting in the European Parliament. Mm. Then we'd have a true democracy. Mm. Um, that's something which everyone didn't want. Uh, the result is we have European parliamentary elections with only 30% mm. uh, participation. People have trust in their national governments, trust in their parliaments. But when they think that something going, is going wrong in the EU, they blame the Commission. No, this isn't correct. They should go, first of all, to the ministers who've taken the decisions. 
Um, okay, thank you. I'm going to ask you one question uh, now to round everything up. Um, do you think, having seen our poll, um, do you think, so just in general, across the country, do you think young people value the EU? I think they're uh, engaged with it, definitely. I think that's been a wonderful thing. And I think, oh, this campaign has been great in that we're talking about it and discussing it and finding out what's going on. And so, yeah, and I hope they, as I say, make the right choice, basically, which is to uh, protect these freedoms that have been won over 800 years. We, we celebrated the 800th year of uh, Magna Carta last year. I mean, these are important things. Every step, every step, English, all these things have led us to this point where we have a democratic free state. That's why so many people want to live here. And so we must protect that. And the idea of that being, sh being shared and 55% of our laws and regulations being made in Brussels can't be right. So I think young people have cottoned on to that and they want to be free and in charge of their own country. Okay. Being free means having the margin of discretion to decide something independently from all the other countries around you who've got the same problems, whether it's on climate change or on products or on data privacy. But all these issues have to be dealt with. Now, it seems to me young people are, are very, have taken Europe for granted, basically. Not many of them know much about the EU, to say the least, about the institutions. And there, I agree with Tim, at last we've been, we're de debating it. But uh, the reality is that, um, in my view, that um, uh, working actively in the EU is not just as something which will comfort young people in protecting their interests, but offers them huge opportunities to develop their own careers, not just in the UK, but elsewhere. OK. Um, so following our vote, we now have a uh, short movie that was made uh, from teachers and pupils at the Boston Junior School on how they feel about the election. Um, thank you to both our guests here. We'll be back after this short package. <laughs> I don't think we should leave the EU. I think there are so many benefits to staying, like the opportunity to live in a multicultural society, like how much migrants bring into the into the country every year, like four million extra revenue. I intend to vote to stay. Um, for me, the positives of staying um, are free trade with Europe. Um, a lot of our trade now happens as part of the service economy. We've moved out of a production economy, so for us to uh, assume that we could survive on our own is frankly quite arrogant. Um, also on a personal level, I think the ability to be able to travel and work freely within Europe is fantastic. It um, opens up lots of opportunities for young people um, and people my age as well. Um, the negatives of staying, I think there's a, there's a few things that need to be ironed out, particularly in the legislation that we need to follow, that's set out by Brussels. Um, the obvious one is in immigration laws. Um, and free movement between countries in the EU, although that is a positive, I think it can also uh, work to the detriment of some countries. Um, I think it's really good that we're having it, and I think it really shows that we are a democratic society, which I really value. Um, and I think it's going to be really interesting to see the outcome of it and see where people stand. My opinion is kind of mixed because, you know, there's pros and cons to it. We're like unified with other countries, so if a country is struggling, we can fund another country, we have like supporting views, we can move to another country if we choose to, that sort of stuff. Overall in support of there being a referendum, but I do get nervous about the whole thing uh, because I'm very much an in supporter and I also think it's just a massive distraction right now when there's some really big issues that need to be sorted out. Um, I think the timing isn't ideal because we've got a really big refugee crisis at the moment and I'm really concerned that they're going to be using that as an argument for um, whether to stay in or out. Uh, thank you to the people who made that film and thank you to the people that participated in that film. Now in the studio we have Professor Charles Lee um, to give us analysis of the referendum and the debate that just happened. Um, and also an outline of what he thinks how the referendum will go tomorrow. 
Um, so, Professor, um, could you introduce yourself and tell us a bit about yourself? Hi, I'm uh, Professor Charles Lees. I'm at the University of Bath uh, in the Department of Politics, Languages, International Studies. Um, I'm a comparative politics scholar. I've been interested in this referendum for a number of reasons. Um, my own personal opinion is probably irrelevant to those reasons. I think I'm interested in it as an sort of exercise in democracy. Um, and I'm really interested to see what kind of questions are going to come out of this debate. Okay, um, so what do you think about, about both campaigns so far? Have they been aggressive? I think both campaigns have epitomised the reason why democracies normally don't have a referendum, because it's been a pretty poor show from both sides, but it's, it's inevitable given the binary choice that referendums give publics. And the more complex the question, and yeah, it's an incredibly complex question, the more tempting it is for both sides to try and boil down their message to a number of sort of almost Pavlovian uh, ad nauseum repetitions of particular messages. So on the uh, Remain side, you have the certain sort of slightly, um, although reasonably credible, but slightly um, stretched um, uh, stories around the, uh, the risk involved in Brexit, which is there, but nevertheless has been packaged in a way that makes it you know, easy to sort of, in a sense, pastiche as Project Fear. And on the Leave side, you've actually got a number of really, really quite, I think, quite dark messages, which have been repeated ad nauseum again and again and again, some of them are empty and some of them actually carry some nasty populist baggage with it around racism and fear of immigration, which I think has been actually quite uh, damaging to the political culture in this country. Um, so, um, as, you, as we've seen, uh, people like the BBC and the Times and stuff have done polls mm -hmm. um, for the months leading up. They varied quite a lot. What do you think about this? I think it's really too close to call. The only thing I would say is that the bookmakers, who have, really do have money on it, um, do seem to be confident it will be a narrow vote for Remain. Um, okay, and uh, what would be the worst case scenario for both options? A narrow vote for Remain actually is probably the worst case scenario in terms of the political culture of this country. You have a group of people with very, very strong opinions about leaving the EU who've come out, if you like, out, out of the closet, if you like, or some of them, uh, uh, in terms of being explicit anti-EU politicians. So you imagine a situation in a couple of years' time when David Cameron's gone, and the next Prime Minister of the country is an explicit outer. How do you manage a party which is meant to be governing a country which is within the EU? At some point, if it's a narrow Remain vote, there'll be another referendum. Uh, it's just inevitable. It has to be really a, a decisive vote for one side or the other, and that's probably not going to happen. Okay. Um, can you see a clear winner in the referendum? Well, that's the point. I, I can't see a clear winner. You can't. Um, I, I, you know, on balance, I think the arguments have, as I said, have degenerated over the course of the referendum. Uh, last week in particular, the tone was awful, and the, the dreadful, brutal murder of Joe Cox happily stopped that descent into real angry populist politics and, and, and gave people time to think. And I think this week the, the tone has been better. Last night was starting to edge into the, the sort of area of personal abuse again, but nevertheless was far better than what we'd seen in the previous few weeks. Um, in, your in your opinion, what's the most important subject of the referendum? Well, I think there's two sides to the referendum. I think there is a problem with the way that political elites frame membership of the EU. Um, it isn't seen to do an awful lot of good for ordinary people, although there actually are huge benefits for ordinary people, but it's not framed in that way in terms of pro-European discourse. We always talk about punching our weight in the world or sort of cooperation across borders, where in fact, for ordinary people, they worry about things like the compression of wages, job security, uh, you know, are they going to be, in a sense, bid, bid out of jobs by immigrants from other parts of the EU? So on that side, I think that the, the immigration debate hasn't been answered by Remain in a satisfactory way. But I think economically, the risks of Brexit have been rather unfortunately put, packaged as pat project fear by the Brexit camp. You know, they are really, really there's very, very clear downside risks to leaving the EU, which has to, have to be engaged with, and the fact that it's always sort of essentially fobbed off as being the kind of scaremongering of experts in the pay of the European Union or the World Bank is, is actually not a satisfactory answer to what is really a serious problem for the, EU, uh, for the UK if we leave. Having said that as well, I think there's also a danger in the fact that if you think about, say, two or three years down the road, 
in an election campaign, when uh, the Labour Party comes out, for example, the Labour Party comes out with a set of, um, set of uh, uh, spending proposals, and the Inf Institute for Fiscal Studies, for example, says the, the, you know, the numbers don't add up, it's going to be very, very hard for a lot of Conservative MPs who basically, in a sense, undermine the credibility of all these institutions to suddenly turn around and say, the Inf Institute for Fiscal Studies say these numbers don't add up, because the first thing that people are going to say is, yeah, but you said two or three years ago you can't believe the Institute for Fiscal Studies. So we've really undermined some of the kind of basic bedrock of how you run a parliamentary democracy. And I, one thing I do hope is that people will look at this and also look at the Scottish referendum and the kind of bad blood that that generated and said, you know, basically come to an agreement that we are not going to have another referendum for at least another generation, because they're incredibly damaging. And that's why we have parliamentary democracy. We elect people to make decisions. OK, um, and what will happen to uh, migrants already in the UK if we vote a leave? Well, I mean, they're protected by EU law. Uh, it will take ages to untangle all the sort of... Uh, the sort of the huge nest of protect, you know, protection that they have under EU law and UK law. A lot of the UK legislation will remain the same because it's essentially kind of almost boilerplate is, legislation. Is there a chance of deportation? No. No, not. But what it does do is create a climate where people feel unwelcome, where people feel that what they thought was a, a, an open, liberal, pluralistic country is closing in on itself. Um, and this will get worse, of course, because if we do vote for Brexit, the kind of deal we'll get from the EU will probably be uh, pretty uh, disadvantageous to ourselves because for the very reason that uh, the... The EU elites don't want to create a situation where there's a successful Brexit, where there's very few costs, and therefore, you know, which encourages other countries to go down the same route. They want, in a sense, show that you know, they don't want to they won't, don't want to destroy the UK or, re, or, or destroy our economy, but they will want to show that it's pretty bumpy and unpleasant leaving the EU. Okay, um, Zoe. So, rather than questions, what are people saying about the referendum? Well, there was one person saying, I think, in London, yeah, vote remain or and vote leave people campaigning outside my tube station this morning. So people are very passionate about what's going on in the world, what's going to happen. OK, um, do you think Scotland, do you think there could be another Scottish referendum if we vote leave? I think that's the other interesting um, uh, side effect of a Brexit vote, which I I hasn't been really dealt with in enough uh, in enough. Uh, sort of analytical depth over the course of the referendum. If Scotland clearly votes to remain and, and England, in a sense, pushes uh, the, the whole UK out because of the sheer weight of numbers, the SNP will definitely use that as an excuse to have another referendum and they'll win it. Okay. At the same time, in Northern Ireland, if suddenly all Northern Ireland's outside of what become new tariff rules, you know, on the mainland of Ireland, there will be pressure there to come to some sort of agreement with the Republic of Ireland, and who knows about Wales? I mean, in, in a sense, what you will see is not just us leaving the Union, but leaving the Union of the United Kingdom and Great Britain as well, because it will break up if, if there is this clear evidence that England has pushed the other nations out of the e out of the EU sheer, by sheer weight of numbers. Okay, um, I think we have a few questions from our audience. So, um, would you like to ask the professor what your questions are? Do you think there's been a fair media portrayal? Of both leave or stay? I think actually there's almost been uh, over, um, over sensitivity to the notion of balance. So um, it, it, this, is where, this is why both sides, in a sense, have almost traded down their message over time. Because I think what started off as an attempt to try and come out with some credible data about some of the risks of Brexit um, was then matched with some claims about the risks of staying in the EU. And both were treated as of equal importance and credibility because the BBC has a slightly sort of simple version of what they think is balance, which is that you have on the one side and then on the other. But if you actually look at the kind of balance of opinion around the world, you know, it was more sort of 80% pro-Remain, 20% pro-Brexit. But the, you know, the, the BBC has been kind of scrupulous in giving a 50-50 at least a 50-50 sort of voice to each side. The print media have been overwhelmingly for Brexit and are incredibly uh, biased in favour of Brexit. Um, OK, I think we have a few more questions yeah. from the audience. So. Does the EU courts make it harder to deport violent criminals? If we left, would this be easier? 
I think there's a, there's a balance there that has to be struck. It's also easier for us, through the European arrest warrant, to bring people back that we want to, uh, uh, we want to uh, prosecute. So I think there is a little bit of a trade-off, and I think if you want to concentrate on violent criminals that we can't deport, then you can make a case of saying, yeah, we could deport them. But on the other hand, there's also British criminals who, in the old days, used to end up on the Costa del Sol, who now find themselves banged up in British jails pretty quickly due to the European arrest warrant. So there is a sort of plus and a minus to both. OK, um, our next question. Is there a compromise that can be reached when a decision is made? That means we don't have to be a member of the EU, but can still get benefits of a member. Why would they give us that? I mean, it's a, it's a really simple question. If, if I turn up and say, I'd like to use, you know, imagine a kind of a cricket club. I want to use your cricket ground, but I don't want to pay the fees, and I don't want to obey the rules. And I probably won't even wear the, you know, obey the dress code, but I'm going to use it whenever I want. It just doesn't work like that. You know, it's a two-sided negotiation. If you join a club, you obey the rules. If you're not in the club, you don't get the benefits of being in the club. Um, so how long will it take, if we vote a Brexit, how long will it take for the UK to get everything sorted out? In, like a timeline, for example. I have no idea. And what's really interesting, and, and it does puzzle me, is that uh, politicians who've fought all their lives, honourably all their lives, to, to try and get to the position where there's a chance of leaving the EU, have not done more work to sort of model that and have, haven't got more of a story to tell about how long that would take. Because clearly nobody knows how long it would take, uh, and it's just fascinating the sort of lack of due diligence that's been, uh, you know, been you know, made on this this particular question. How do we get ourselves extricated from what is an incredibly complex organisation, with the minimum of disruption and with the minimum of sort of uh, fear for international markets? No runs on the pound, therefore no rises in interest rates. I think it's a really difficult call, and it will take probably five to ten years. There's been a I've noticed there's been a lot of. Um, criticism because experts such as yourself are being ignored on their opinion and stuff. Do you believe you've, people like yourself have been ignored? Well, you're not ignoring me. Um, the, the, uh, I, think, I think there's been, it's inevitable in a democracy that you will uh, try and find uh, faces that are recognisable to convey messages. So it's much more interesting for people if David Beckham says remain than if I say remain. And it's much more interested in Tony Parsons, for example, who was on last night, says Brexit than if uh, uh, another colleague of mine, Bill Derodi, in the department who's pro-Brexit says that. So I, I think it's inevitable. But underneath that, there's a lot of briefing that we've been doing. Uh, the bookies, for example, are briefed quite heavily by a number of political scientists. So one of the reasons why the bookies are still kind of edging towards Remain is because of that kind of under-the-radar under briefing by political scientists. OK, um, a question from the audience. Do you believe that there is a correlation between the timing of the referendum and the migrant crisis we are facing across this part of the world? I think it's really unfortunate. Uh, I think the, uh, the, the counterfactual question would be, if there wasn't a European Union and you suddenly had that influx of refugees last year, which wasn't caused by the European Union, it was caused by instability in the Middle East, how would have that been dealt with? I think it, it, it was... Such numbers is almost impossible to deal with in a in a, a pain-free way. I think the way that the European Union managed it was somewhat clumsy. I think the way it did expose Germany's influence in the European Union wasn't helpful. Um, and people need to think long and hard about how they manage the process of making these off-the-cuff ad hoc decisions in the future. Because clearly the European Union, as it has more power, will have to make these decisions much quicker and in a less obviously um, top-down way. OK, um, thank you. We're now going to give two minutes um, for each candidate um, to give another pitch on the questions that have been asked today uh, and a sum up of ev everything we spoke about in the programme. Um, so, Tim, you have uh, two minutes. I think there's, uh, it's been a great debate. It's, it's wonderful to hear the views of uh, young people because this is a great chance for them to vote for their future of their country. Um, lots of fears have been mentioned. Um, these are just projected fears and, and, and basically I think you've got to look at our strengths as a country. I mean, are we a small, weak country? No, we're not. We're the fifth largest economy in the world. We, can, we are trading with all countries around the world. Let's embrace that. This is a really positive op opportunity to make our own trade deals. So I think that's a, that's a very good start of it. But also we, we can see the kind of failures of the European Union. And, and again, I love Europe. 
I met my wife in Europe, I've studied European culture, I love it. I still want to go there. And again, Brexit won't affect that. But it is, it's, it's a vote for saying, has the European Union been uh, an effective um, organisation? And I'm afraid again and again in foreign policy it fails. It's not delivering major growth. The, um, the um, unemployment rates for young people is outrageous across uh, Europe, and that's creating political instability there. So I think use that um, Brexit vote, vote out, and that will help transform Europe. It will shake up the European Union and we'll get um, a much better, more positive Europe. So I think this is a chance to send a very good message there because our politicians haven't been good at dealing with that. David Cameron tried to get a deal, failed, and I think it's up to us to send that message that the European Union is not working and we can have a better deal with Europe, carry on trading with there, but also with the rest of the world. So I think it's a wonderful chance to vote for our freedom and our sovereignty. OK, thank you. Um, Professor, what do you think about what Tim just said there? I think, I mean, Tim, Tim, Tim's message is actually quite a positive one, OK? And, and I think it, it, it's a shame, actually, that more of the campaign wasn't a little bit more framed in that sort of style of positive uh, debate about Britain's strengths in the world, which are undeniable. We're a great country, fifth largest economy in the world. The question is whether you want us to cooperate with our friends or go out on our own. Uh, obviously, some people will make one decision, some people will make the other. Tim's put it in the, the best of okay. possible ways. OK, thank you for that. Um, so, Lo, you have two minutes. Well, I've said it before, Britain is stronger, safer, better off by exploiting its situation in Europe. But staying in, remaining in the European Union is not an easy option, nor is Brexit. You've got to work at it. You've got to take leadership on issues which are really important for the country. And don't forget, too, we are not voting on the parts of uh, the EU which the UK is not in. <laughs> We're not voting for or against the euro <laughs> because we are isolated from the euro. We're not vo vo voting for or against a passport-free uh, movement. That is also outside the uh, British uh, uh, bloc. And we've also got a rebate and so on and so on. So we've got a very specialized EU dimension for the UK. And I can't see why we should throw the baby out with the bathwater and give up what has already been achieved in order to ensure that we have solutions which, in any case, will re in, in immigration, in climate change elsewhere, will require us to work with our neighbours. And our neighbours are there for, for the long term. They're not going to disappear into the other side of the Atlantic or the Pacific. Thank you. OK, thank you to everyone who has watched the programme. Thank you for tweeting in. Um, thank you to the professor and our two guests on the campaign today. Um, we have no idea how the vote will go tomorrow, but please make sure you get out and you vote. Thank you very much for watching the show today, and, and thank you to Summer Valley for broadcasting us.